Many of us in the body of Christ have done a disservice to these precious gifts God has given us, our mind and our body. We've forsaken God's miracle of turning dust into destiny and have put that miracle in a state of distress. In other words, church, we are sick. Come on, just love up on them. Just love up on them. Just love up on them. God, we love you. God, we thank you. God, we worship you. You're so awesome. You're so magnificent. You're so amazing. You're so majestic. We love you and we thank you and we love you and we thank you and we love you and we thank you for who you are, for waking us up this morning and starting us on our way and giving us food on our table and giving us shelter and I God, we love you. God, we love you. want to rush out of worship. Walls fall when we worship. And in this moment, God, we offer the best sacrifice of praise that we can utter out of our mouths. So when you hear the groans and the moans and the hallelujahs, that's all we can do because everything you've done for us and how you blessed us and how you brought us, we can't say it enough. God is preaching time and the master needs you to move. We need you, we need you, we need you to move, master. God, there's a hard word today, but I pray that the deliverance will come. We thank you now for an opportunity to translate what we believe you are trying to get to our hearts. Lord, open us up. Devil, you're bound in the name of Jesus. Let this place permeate with thy spirit, O Lord. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Let's give God a, a hand clap of praise for this awesome choir for the Spirit of God moving in this place. I see your hands lifted. I'm not gonna stop you. I see your, some of you just can't even stop worshiping and it's okay. It's okay. We thank God for Sunday morning. If you can, please stand and join me. Mm-hmm. It's our power. You can't act up an hour of power. We gotta stay on time. To my sister, AKAs, they got jokes put me on AKA Sunday. <laughs> That's why I got on red shoes, hallelujah. It is a blessing to be here on your day. If you know anything about our history, we are one. I, I pledged at a predominantly white institution, and I wish somebody would have came for an AKA while I was there. We didn't understand division at my school. And so my experience with all the moms, mom gun, I see Deacon Wallace, Alt Laney, all my sisters, you all are my moms and sisters, and I love you to life. But I had to bring some sorrows with me. <laughs> just in case you didn't like my sermon, just to, <laughs> Had to bring some help. <laughs> Ooh, okay. Let's just throw it out there. We do have fun in church. We can have fun in church. Hallelujah. Matthew chapter 8. Honoring our pastor in his absence for this opportunity. Matthew chapter 8, verses 16 through 18, and then verses 23 through 26. This was a hard assignment. But we thank God for hard assignments. If you have it, please say amen. amen. I'm going to read verse chapter 16. That evening they brought to him many who were possessed with demons, and he cast out the spirits with a word and cured all who were sick. 
This was to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took our infirmities and bore our diseases. Now, when Jesus saw great crowds around him, he gave orders to go over to the other side. Come down to verse 23. And when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him and a windstorm arose on the sea so great that the boat was being swamped by the waves, but he, meaning Jesus, was asleep. And when they went and woke him up saying, Lord, save us, we're perishing. He said to them, why are you afraid? You of little faith. That's all we need to say. You may be seated in the presence of God. Just for a few moments, I want to preach from the subject, finding me time in the midst of your mayhem. Finding me time in the midst of your mayhem. Alfred Street, this entire month we've been embarking on a journey around caring for the gifts of God. Our pastor taught us about being good stewards of our resources and good stewards of earth. He preached a sermon on climate change. That's my pastor, that's my pastor. And I was overwhelmed with gratitude last week when ministers Barbara and Elijah showed off and preached a sermon about being good stewards of the community and your relationships. But church, none of this is relevant and none of this is even possible if we do not take a practical assessment of how we are taking care of our own selves. And that is to be good stewards of the temple that the Lord has entrusted us with. And I must be honest that this preaching assignment made me side-eye Jesus because I knew this sermon would expose me to me. It's not cool to be convicted about your own personal journey and good intentions to have self-care when you're in the business of pastoral care. Christianity as an organized religion has built our core principles around how you provide for others. You know, it's the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And this mantra known to even the youngest of hearts it would make sense if those of us, particularly in the black community, would do for ourselves and care for ourselves the way that this phrase assumes that we do. I had to ask myself, my physical and my mental self, hey self, what would it look like for me to care for others the way that I care for myself? What would it be if I made provision for others the way I make provision for myself? Not my husband, not my children, not my business, provision for myself. And when I had a chance to meditate on this question, crickets. And it was clear to me that if I began to care for others the way I care for me, that person would be hangry sometimes malnourished sometimes. They would have family and friends that they love so much but rarely got a chance to hang out with sometimes. They would never get enough sleep. They would never have time to exercise regularly. And the opportunity to sit still would almost never happen. If I had to care for others the way I care for myself, they would have an additional extremity called the smartphone on their body. <laughs> their fingers would lay on a laptop all day long and for pleasure. They grab that box of double stuffed Oreos to bless their souls. <laughs> and I know I'm not alone. It's okay. I'm going to tell the truth in, in church. Many of us in the body of Christ have done a disservice to these precious gifts God has given us, our mind and our body. We've forsaken God's miracle of turning dust into destiny and have put that miracle in a state of distress. In other words, church, we are sick. Our bodies, our minds are waving the white flag, crying out for retreat, crying out for repair, crying out for even a little bit of rest. But we continue to fill our heads with this false revelation that if I do just a little bit more, everything's going to get better. If I go harder, it's going to get better. If I stay later in the office, it's going to get better. If I get that raise and sign that deal, even if I lose my sanity, it's going to get better. If I sleep with him or her, it will get better. If I take one last hit, if I take one last sip, 
it will get better. And what we perceive to be better can actually become a burden that will continue to carry our attention away from the health and spiritual needs of our minds and bodies. So church, today I want us to think about us. It's in our DNA to render service. We care for the sick, we feed the hungry, we clothe the naked. I mean, we're Alfred Street. It's in our DNA to render service. We feed 5,000, we help people with hidden halos, we cancel collegiate debts, we distribute water with global missions, and I celebrate the spirit of service that is commanded to us by God. But this morning, I would suggest to you that many of us in this very sanctuary are trying to fill an internal void in the name of rendering service, but you are doing your mind and your body a disservice. You're eating your pain away. You're drinking your trials away. You're saying yes when the full sentence of no would actually do your body good. We're not understanding the consequence of committing spiritual and emotional suicide when we decide we're not going to care for ourselves. And instead of pulling the trigger, you prolong your self-inflicted death by pulling all-nighters, by ingesting unhealthy foods that are affecting your organs, by drinking only Henny. <laughs> when you should be flushing with H2O. Staying in an abusive relationship instead of exposing them to save face for you and your abuser. Trying to climb corporate ladders and cracking the glass ceiling, checking off all of society and even your family's expectation boxes. All the while setting yourself up for an epic emotional breakdown and physical meltdown. Alpha Street, we must reconcile that our physical bodies and mental wellness are vital parts of the equation for effective ministry and effective personal and professional lives. You see, you cannot serve sick. You can't witness when you're not well. You cannot offer a sacrifice when you sacrifice your body and your mind. And who better to help us understand this lesson other than Jesus himself? The book of Matthew takes us on a journey of Jesus' life from birth to manhood in three chapters. Matthew is explicit in highlighting Jesus' transition from man-child to Messiah. And it gives us an intimate walk of what I call the Christian living blueprint. And by the time we find ourselves in chapter 8, he has done a great work. He has taught some of the most memorable lessons in the scripture. He's been on for the people all night long. He's stolen the show and is a hot commodity in town. Everyone is pulling at the man who was healing the sick, who was casting out demons and making everyone's life better around him. But then he does something that many of us fail to model in our lives. You see, when Jesus sees the massive crowds, it doesn't deter him from his duty. When life goes crazy around him, he doesn't take on their demons. He creates personal space to sustain himself and his gifts. And if I can say it this way, Jesus made a conscious decision to find me time in the midst of the mayhem around him. Church, there's gonna be times when you're bombarded with life's trials, you've done all you can do, you've said all you can say, and no matter your good intentions to find time to save yourself, there will, be, there will seem to be no respite place in sight. But it's during those times that you must remember that you are human with limited capacity. And the only way you can be a blessing to others is if you're going to be a blessing to your own self. So, so, so the real question you must ask yourself is, how do you save yourself from yourself? H how do you keep your physical and mental stability in unstable circumstances? Well, in order to do that first, you must identify and fulfill your God-given assignments on earth. Come to verse 16 with me. That even they brought to him many who were possessed with demons, and he cast out the spirits with the word, and watch, he cured all who were sick. The next verse says, this was to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah. 
He took our infirmities and bore our diseases. These verses paint a picture of how necessary Jesus was to those around him. And the Bible says, when Jesus performed miracles, he was fulfilling a prophecy written already in Isaiah. Brothers and sisters, understand Jesus' role. He is fulfilling his calling, and that calling affected him personally and those around him. In other words, he had a clear understanding of what his assignment was on earth and did everything that it was necessary to do to fulfill his destiny. But church, I want to argue something with you this morning, that if you take a comprehensive assessment of your life today, many of us would reluctantly admit that we are still searching for our God-ordained assignment on earth, and we seem to be walking in our own personal and professional wilderness. And when you are in a season of searching, you can find yourself vulnerable to some things. When you've not found that place, that purpose, that passion that sustains you, you might be susceptible to some things. You, you may accept abuse, you may have melancholy moods, you may be depressed or have doubt or dormant dreams. You can even have physical and mental distress. What do you mean, preacher? I mean, the more you operate in wilderness, constantly looking for what you're supposed to be doing, the more trauma can come. And truth be told, for those who you live with, who you work with, and even those that you worship with are directly affected by your personal journey. You see, the faster you find your calling, the faster you find your wellness. And when you secure your place of clarity, you immediately help to sustain positive environments around you. One of the most difficult things to witness is when someone is not fulfilling their calling, when they're just surviving and not thriving, when life is just about careers that pay the bills instead of paying bills and making meaningful change. Operating your purpose, it allows you to expand your capacity. It allows you to build esteem. And operating in your purpose yields new opportunities for you that you may have never experienced. But let me dispel some of the myths that I know you're thinking. Knowing your assignment does not mean you will not have trials in life. It means you'll be in a position to know how to better manage your trials. Knowing your assignment doesn't mean you won't have stress in your life. It means you learn how to better manage stress in your life. Knowing your assignment doesn't mean that there'll be no setbacks in your life. It means you'll be more equipped now to see your setbacks as setups for comebacks to move your life ahead. And what I can tell you from experience is that well-being is directly affected by your life's work. Some of my happiest moments were in my career at the NAACP, fighting for justice, meeting the president, working on the Affordable Care Act. It was my joy. I worked for the Surgeon General and gave advice on some of the largest pieces of legislation in this country, but then an election happened. I found myself in a dark place. I was unhealthy and unhappy. I could barely get out of bed because I was physically sick to even go to work because I knew I wasn't working in my passion. All the while not knowing that God was working on my behalf and pushing me to fulfill my God-given destiny, to become an entrepreneur because, you see, when you don't have money, you gotta find work somewhere. We had a two-year-old and no health care, And he said, what you gonna do now, preacher? Do you trust me? Are you in my assignment? Not knowing that that push would make me an entrepreneur, a preacher, and a social justice advocate on God's terms, not my terms. And I'm a witness that when you are walking in your assignment, things that used to take you out, they now excite you when they come. When you're walking in your assignment, the blows that they throw don't even phase you anymore. They excite you because you want to know what's coming next, Jesus. I'm walking in my assignment. The haters that used to come to you when you weren't walking in your assignment, when they show up, you get excited when they come because you know something must be coming on the other side of your hate on me. That moves my spirit because I know we are in peril times. Gallup initiated a poll on the five elements of well-being. Those elements are social, financial, community, physical, and career. The five elements affect each other, 
but the one that affects your health the most is your career and life work. I want to speak to those that are in school this morning. Find your passion place of study today to prepare you for your God-given assignment. You see, if you don't operate in your gift, young people, you're taken away from your well-being. If you don't operate in your gift, someone in the world that needs your gift will miss out on your gift. For the person that's in their career, knowing that you go on to work hating it every single day. You do not have passion for your work. It's time for you to make an adjustment and find your place of passion and purpose. It's never too late in your career to find out what God really wants you to do. And for the seasoned saints in the house, you thought I was gonna miss you because you're retired. If you're still living, you still got work to do. If you're still living, you're on a journey for wellness to do. And I'm calling on the seasoned saints. Don't let these young people act the fool. Pull them aside and say, baby, I've been there. I've done that. And my assignment is to change your life. Your work is not done. And I urge you to find your place of ministry and passion. Alpha Street, be the change agent you want to be. Be the person God created you to be. Follow Jesus in fulfilling the prophecy over your life. Huh. Not only must you identify and fulfill your God-given assignment, but in order to save yourself from yourself and to find your physical and mental stability in unstable circumstances, you must recognize the signs of instability in your environment. Come to verse 18 with me. Now, when Jesus saw the great crowds around him, he gave orders to go to the other side. The Message Bible translates it this way, and this is how I knew Jesus was black, right here. This is what he said. Listen, when Jesus saw that a curious crowd of folk were coming, and it was growing by the minute, he told the disciples to get him out of there to the other side of the lake. I know it, I know it. I know then he played something that day. Get me out of here from these people. Jesus is fulfilling a prophecy and is on earth doing exactly what he's called to do. But watch, when he's on the right track, when he's aligned with the assignment, the atmosphere begins to change around him. You see, the more he does what he's supposed to do, the more the people demand of him. The more he does what he's supposed to do, the more the people pull on him. And I love this part of the text because Jesus is laying out a public health strategy. I'm in public health. And you might miss this if you're reading this wrong. That is, when you are operating in stable conditions and environments, you're less likely to fall into dis-ease. Why? Because you're operating at a level that you can control. You, you control what you take in and what you give off. But I suggest to you that when your environment begins to change, and when your circumstances begin to change, that which is normally functional becomes dysfunctional, you've got to identify a new action plan. The Message Bible helps us understand this predicament that he is in. The curious crowd is what he calls it was growing by the minute. And I like that translation because when you use an adjective like curious in our community, you know something's up. <laughs> curious crowd was coming. And I started to think about the translation of us in 2019. 2019. What does the curious crowd look like for us? Curious crowd is coming. That stress is coming. That drama is coming. Your hate is coming. Your doubt is coming. The request for me to do more than people need or have tolerance for me to do is coming. When Jesus recognizes an unhealthy pursuit, he immediately switches his position. When he recognizes the direction they were going in, he detours his direction. Why? Because he was aware of his surroundings. Church, I urge you this morning to be aware of your surroundings. Watch what you and who you surround yourself with. To sustain your wellness, you've got to be able to identify the who, what, when, where, and why of the curious crowd is showing up at your front door. 
And when you experience more stress than you should normally be expected, when your body begins to show you new signs of an ache or a pain, when something in your spirit just don't settle right, you need to change your position. Jesus would not fall prey to an unstable environment even though he could have. Don't miss the lesson. Jesus could have stayed. He could have continued to deal with the curious crowd. But he commanded the disciples, get me out of here. The Greek translation for depart, as written in this version, is a parakomai, it means to set off, to cast and go away from. And I love that translation because it helps us understand Jesus was intentional with removing himself and removing his gifts from harm. There's some people in your midst that want to cause you harm, but you've got gifts and talents and treasures to protect from the curious crowd coming around you. And if Jesus can decide enough is enough, that should make you shout this morning. You tell him, you know what? Jesus said enough is enough. Enough is enough. There's some things I'm just not going to do anymore. There's some things I don't have to do because it's in the text. Alpha C, you got to recognize what's happening around you. You're operating in unstable conditions because that's always the thing you've known. It's always been that way. And on the surface, you look pretty. Like you're handling it very well. But the danger of not heeding the signs is that you are not aware of what's happening to you right in your face. This ease is planting itself in your soul and you have no idea because you look pretty. The signs are clear. The people are pulling at you. Coworkers are coming for you. Money's funny. Body on the brink of breakdown. Your house is not a home, and you're trying to keep up with Joneses that you don't even know. <laughs> the signs are clear. Your body's beginning to ache. You've got tension headaches. When you see them, you start twitching. But you've been so conditioned in the society to just hang in there. Hang in there. When your body is saying, retreat, fool, retreat. Get out. And I find it interesting that many people and even church people Use your good intention of perseverance as a tool for manipulation. They want you to do something they want you to do. And then you become complicit in the quest against your own wellness because you chose to ignore the signs of an unstable environment. I urge you today, opt out today. Opt out of overload, opt out of drama, opt out of conforming to what everyone else tells you they need you to do that's harmful to you. Now my disclaimer is this and I gotta go. It's not a license for you to quit on working on your marriage. It's not a license to quit on working hard on your business. It's not a license for you to quit working hard in school, but what it is is a warning to never let your guard down when it comes to your well-being. Let me close. Not only must you identify and fulfill your God-given assignment, not only must you recognize the signs of an unstable environment around you, but in order to save yourself from yourself, you've got to choose your body over perceived burdens. <laughs> Verse 23 says, he got into the boat, and the disciples, they followed him. A windstorm arose on the sea, so great that the boat was swamped, by the ways, but Jesus, he was asleep. When Jesus got into the boat church, he mid-course corrected his journey to continue his work. Now this part of the text was crucial to consider because when he was in alignment, when he recognized the crowd was curious and changed positions, he never got off of track of God's plan for him. But even though he was on the right track, 
there were still more unstable encounters down the road. But Jesus, being the teacher that he is, challenges you and I today without saying one word. The text doesn't give us any indication that Jesus provided a warning. But we know that Jesus knew everything. He knew what the future would entail, but never compromised his own sanity because of the storms growing around him. Jesus didn't say a word. And I had to think about our experiences today, about how much sleep we lose, how much anxiety we have when things around us are starting to spiral out of control, and that very anxiousness many times leads us down the road of unhealthy behavior, emotional eating, sedentary lifestyles, surfing Facebook and Instagram for your answers. <laughs> Jesus' action speaks volumes because when the storms came, he didn't sway. When the craziest came, he didn't react to the crazy. He stayed in his cradle place of rest. Jesus never let the perceived burden of the storm interfere with what his body needed for the rest of the journey. Now that's easier said than done because I feel like if I was on that boat and I saw that first wave come, is he still asleep? Jesus. So I don't want to act like that's not a reality. <laughs> but this moment in the text, it helps us come to grips with the reality of our lives. Church, stop conforming to theology that church folk won't be challenged. Stop listening to false teaching that success is instant when you know Jesus. No. Storms are coming. Yes. It's an absolute. The challenges will meet you. You're going to have ups and downs. But the place where we can shout this morning is that your mind and your body never have to conform to storms. Yes. You missed it. You missed it. I'm going to bring it back. You missed it. The storms are coming. Yes. They're going to act a fool in your life. Yes. But the difference between you and them is that you've got Jesus who blueprinted for you, you don't have to conform because the storms are coming. <laughs> you don't have to switch your action plan because they hating on you. When work gets crazy, don't stay in the crazy. Choose your body over the burden. When your children stress you out, call somebody. And then choose your body over the burden. When your spouse brings you drama, you don't even know where it came from. Pray for them and then choose your body over your burden. Your ability to find your wellness is connected to your commitment to doing God's will for your life. So that doesn't exempt you from storms, but it prepares you when they come. So instead of choosing something unhealthy to do, find your healthy alternative to weather the storm. Instead of stressing out alone, call your therapist. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm gonna clap for myself because I know that's important. You're real churchy with that. You're real churchy. Call your therapist. Pray with the pastor and call the licensed person who can medicate you if you need it. I don't, I don't, it doesn't matter to me. I don't, I don't, I don't, I, I'm, I'm, I'm tired of you acting like that's why God gave us medical care. That's why we've got health care and use the gifts that God put in them to bless you. Stop worrying about what they think. Let them be crazy all by themselves. You go get your help. Oh, I'm, I thank God for this. Go get your own help. Because I had to get okay with that. Preachers, go get counseling so we can deal with the church folk. Mamas, go get counseling so you don't hurt that baby when they go off on you. Husbands, go get counseling. If you're divorced, if you're single, go get counseling. It'll bless your life. You'll be a better Christian. Huh. 
And watch the lesson, I gotta go. Jesus takes on a storm with a clear mind and a clear body because he rested. Don't miss that. Your work will be more productive if you get rest. Your attitude will be more balanced. If you go to sleep. Our society is so hypocritical because when I say the word selfish, they make you think that you are overlooking people's needs when in reality, the most selfish people love to leech on selfless people. So church, today is Selfish Sunday. And I charge you today to choose yourself today. Selfish Sunday, a day when you commit your physical and mental well-being to the one who has power to give you your well-being. Selfish Sunday, a day when you reconcile your guilt and shame about your past choices and you re reconsider new choices for your life. It's Selfish Sunday, the day you decide that your mayhem will no longer take away from your me time. Go get a haircut. Go get a massage. Turn off the phone and use the ignore signal on your phone. The body of Christ is at crossroads. The clock waits for no one. If we do not change our habits, someone's life is at stake. I'm convicted to say this. If you don't change the way you eat, the way you live, the way you rest, you will not be well enough to help save a soul. And their life is predicated on you taking care of your life. If you're hurting right now, go tell someone I'm hurting. If someone's hurting you, come tell us. We won't judge you. I'll close with this. When was the last time you did something for yourself? When was the last time you stopped and did nothing? When was the last time you paused for a cause called me? Alpha Street, the world needs all of you healthy. And I implore you to commit to finding me time in the midst of your mayhem. I love you.